please welcome Atlantic staff writer, Shirley Lee. Balancing parenting and work is difficult during the best of times, but a global pandemic introduces challenges none of us could have expected. I am pleased to be joined by Aisha Curry, the entrepreneur, philanthropist, and best-selling author of The Seasoned Life, whose latest cookbook, The Full Plate, features recipes for parents helping to provide flavorful meals while juggling work with childcare. Aisha, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Of course. So, Aisha, I know you have a lot going on at the moment. Uh, Your book is on shelves this week, and you just announced that you're starting a production company. Uh, But I want to focus on life at home first. So, obviously, you and Stefan have become parenting role models for so many. What are the biggest challenges, would you say, as a parent during the pandemic? I would definitely say like life is chaotic right now, as I'm sure it is for everyone, parent or not. Um, But for us, I feel like our parenting style has always been, uh, especially now, a little bit relaxed. Our kids are still young. They're eight, five and two. And so for us, it's really been taking this time to kind of lean into just nurturing them as human beings. Um, And, you know, the education is there and we, We make sure they're in school and they're doing the things where things aren't working out that day. We just take it one step at a time. It's more about leaning into their personalities during this time and making sure that, you know, their mental health is, is, is right where it needs to be because I feel like things are chaotic and just so unpredictable right now. And so really just checking in with them, making sure again, that, that humanity part of them is, is, is intact and good to go and that they're just good people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for you personally, what keeps you going? Uh, Have you had any moments where you felt tested by everything going on? Well, I'm not going to lie. Like a good glass of wine usually does the trick (laughs) in the evenings and that morning cup of coffee. Uh, But I would say, again, things are so unpredictable right now. And so there's moments where you want to cry and then you start laughing because you're like, what is actually happening? Um, there's days when you're sad and there's days when you are, you know, finding the silver linings and trying to just enjoy that extra togetherness that a lot of us have been able to have. But I would say for me, what keeps me going is like leaning into those emotions. So not like burying them. Um, so I don't have like a pile high rug of like emotionalness. <laughs> Um, and so for me, it's like letting the moment happen and then letting it pass. It keeps me sane. Got it. Well, now the full plate focuses on nurturing your family through food and it's packed with recipes that highlight how family dinners encourage happy and a strong family life. So what inspired this approach for this cookbook, especially after your first? Yeah, I, I would say that there's so many layers um, to how the book came about and just the the meaning behind it and what I hope it brings to people. Um, it, it, its inception was around the chaos of life, to be honest. I, it's been almost four years since my first cookbook. And I said I didn't want to do one until, a second one, until I felt inspired or, you know, ready to, to dig deep into it. Um, because you know, what's in the book, it's, it's there forever. Um, when you, when you publish something and it's in print, um, and so I wanted it to be quality and make sense and have meaning. And so for me, it was, it's a reflection of the chaos of life, but going back to my core values of making sure that, you know, I'm getting my family around the table, um, and encouraging people to do the same because it really is the foundation for, you know, healthy relationships communicating with your kids, your friends, your family, whatever it may be. Um, And I feel like a good meal does that. It brings people together. It's the whole reason why I love food. It's such a a vessel for communication and change and just happiness. Um, And so for me, being able to do that in a quick and easy way where I wasn't, you know, giving giving up on um, the quality of the meal and the flavor that umami like I wanted something that could be quick, 15, 20, 30 minutes, 
get the dinner on the table, but it's still like delicious and everybody's happy. And so that's kind of how the book came about. Um, there's also great cocktails in there. I feel like every meal prep should start with a cocktail <laughs> around dinner time. And so um, that's really the focus of the book is dinner and drinks. Um, there's a couple of desserts in there, but that's really where I lean into the meal um, is with dinner. So I want it to be uh, a reflection of that. Speaking of umami, I was curious, uh, what are the kids' favorite meals from the book? Because I, I would suspect that they really like the umami sauce. <laughs> yes. So um, that's kind of my special, I call it my secret sauce to the kids. It's super simple, though, as you can see in the book. Um, but I would say uh, Cannon, my two-year-old, is who loves that the most. Um, he... He, he loves to just dip things, and so um, the chicken bites with the umami sauce is perfect for him. I would say um, my daughter, Ryan, our middle child, is five, um, and she really, really loves any sort of pasta. So the crab bucatini is her jam. Um, the, mac and, the umami mac and cheese, she loves that. Um, but with her, she really eats anything, so it's, it's, it's an easy bet with her. And then our oldest, Riley, loves like your your traditional meal. So a starch, lots of veg, a protein. And so she actually enjoys the cherry lamb loin um, in there and any sort of fish. So I have a, a delicious poached halibut with an orange for blanc and she like loves it. That's something I make on special occasions when I have a little bit more time. Um, but yeah, she's I, I lucked out with my kids. They're not they're not very picky. <laughs> That's good to hear. Uh, so I want to pivot to talking about a foundation that you and Steph launched recently called Eat, Learn, Play. I understand that one of the goals of Eat, Learn, Play is to end childhood hunger uh, in underserved communities across the Oakland and Alameda counties in California. So what, state, what steps have you and the foundation taken during the pandemic to carry out this objective? Yeah, so we, we launched Eat, Learn, Play in July of 2019, so just a little bit over a year. Um, and we were going to slow roll it, you know, <laughs> ease our way in, and then the pandemic hit, and we quickly had to learn on our feet and rally the troops and be boots on the ground. And um, what I came to realize, what, what we've always set out to do is, is be the connective tissue um, between people who are already, organizations that are already doing amazing things and help to amplify that. And so what I've found um, in the midst of this pandemic is people have really stepped, stepped up to the plate. Um, and I've never seen a truer sense of community in my life. Um, I feel like what I've witnessed through the work we're doing to learn play is what community is. And um, we, we were able to come together and create this full circle um, effect where restaurants have been able to reopen in Oakland because they're providing the food for the families in the community, which in turn, you know, opens up job opportunities for people um, in the Oakland community. And so it's been this full circle effect. Um, and our hope is that people look at the model we've implemented into Oakland and take that into their own communities and amplify um, because I've always said it really does take a village um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And um, no matter who you are, and I just feel like people now more than ever need, need the help. Um, and we've just been so grateful to be able to lend a helping hand during this time. And so we've had to scale quickly um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad we've been able to keep up with the, the demand, but obviously <laughs> there's, it doesn't seem like there's light right now at the end of the tunnel uh, for when this thing is going to be over. And so we're just going to keep trucking along. And we're so grateful to all of our partners for making sure that, you know, we're able to keep up with everything. Yeah, that leads me to my next question. I understand that Eat, Learn, Play has been really successful. I mean, you guys have delivered over 7 million meals and worked with 130 restaurants in the area, but what are what are the biggest challenges to sustaining that success, especially now? I would say the biggest challenge, honestly, is how quickly the need is expanding. 
Um, and it, again, it's great that we've been able to keep up with it. But when you look at the numbers, and like we don't, we don't need a applaud or like a pat on the back. You know, it's the I, I, the numbers to me are a reflection that there's more work that needs to be done to get to a place where we don't have to be doing this. Um, and so, if anything, it just it's it, it's sad to me that you know it as quickly as it is uh, because that means that there's you know more people that need help. And um, for me, I feel like again making sure that we have strong partnerships has been really key into making sure that we're able to you know keep a tight ship and 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 run it smoothly. Um, and and so again, just super grateful. Um, but I would say the biggest challenge thus far has been um, making sure that we're adhering to um, all of the COVID rules while making sure that we're getting people their meals um, and their school supplies and all of the things that they need. And so I would say that's been the, in my opinion, the, the, the biggest hurdle, but I think we've done a, a, a good job thus far. And now I wanted to talk to you about how this pandemic has also helped to expose deep cultural inequalities. And I understand that you have discussed the Black Lives Matter movement with your children and that your oldest has been asking you questions about the protests in particular. So in such a close knit family, do you like to be open with your children about such big issues? And how do you broach the subject of race with your three little ones? Absolutely. That's a great question. I, I We are definitely, uh, we're going to tackle the conversations head on type of parents. I feel like, um, and I think a lot of people, a lot of uh, millennial parents um, are feeling the same way. We were sort of raised where, you know, you don't really speak, you're, you're not spoken to, you, you, you're afraid to kind of ask the question. And I just didn't want that for the kids and so we're very open with them when it comes to all the social injustices that are happening because I I truly believe that that not sugarcoating is like the first step to um, seeing change and so for us you know just instilling our values in them from a young age and making them aware of what's going on so that they can see the change that we want to see has been really 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 important. And so I, I feel like no child is too young to understand what's going on in their own backyard. So, Absolutely. Well, now going back to the full plate, just to wrap up, uh, you know, you incorporate flavors from your Black and Jamaican heritage, and you consulted with your relatives on ingredients for a variety of recipes. So I just wanted to ask, how can food play a role in teaching children about their culture? Why is it important to do so? Oh, man. Well, as my oldest runs out of the room. Guys, this is real life here, okay? <laughs> this is this is pandemic listening right here. Um, but I would say, oh, man, it's I, I just think about myself right now in the midst of everything that's going on and not being able to see certain family and not having those traditions that I'm so used to being able to prepare the food that I grew up with and that my grandma made for me and having that cultural side of me has been everything. Like for my for my mental health, for feeling that sense of comfort, it, it's crazy how food can truly change your and shape your emotions and take you back to, you know, the happiest of moments or wherever, any dish can take you back to a moment. And so for me, like I'm Jamaican um, and I love oxtail and curry goat and rice and peas and escabeche fish and having that knowledge and that background that's been passed down for me to be able to prepare that during this time has been everything. And so um, I think it's so important to make sure no matter what your background is, that you're ex- having that experience with your children and passing on that tradition. Um, because again, food is, food is such a vessel um, for so many different things. And so... I, I just love how I'm able to share that story of my culture through food. 
Absolutely. Well, then on that note, Aisha, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, for everyone tuning in, you can get a copy of The Full Plate along with books by our other festival speakers at the Atlantic's page on bookshop.org. Perfect. Don't forget to vote, everyone.